There we go. All right, we are recording. We are live. Um, I'm doing something a little different today. Uh, so first off, uh, just a quick um, uh, set of housekeeping. So uh, we're all the attendance grades are up to date. Um, as for homework uh, grading, homework 5.1 is graded, 5.2 is graded, uh, 5.3 is currently being graded. 5.4 is due today. After class today, I'll, I'll post the solution for homework 5.3, uh, and then um, uh, you all are going to have homework 6.1 today. And so what that means is we're actually done with columns. Uh, we have finished our discussion of columns, and we are into our final topic for the semester, which is on beams. Um, we're going to spend a, a good bit of time on beams. We're going to spend the rest of the semester on that. So there's a there's a lot going on there. Um, the one of the things that that we noticed with columns hopefully we, we uh, that that you noticed uh, in our discussion is that what really affects a column's capacity is its bracing right the the longer the distance between braces the weaker the column you know and the same thing is true with beams the longer the distance is between uh the braces um uh, uh the weaker the beam is and so uh, the way that we're going to handle beam design is we're going to sort of look at beams in two different categories. We're going to look at one category where beams uh, are uh, completely braced. They, well, we call it continuously braced, so that there is there is no bracing issue whatsoever. And then the second uh, 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 scenario we're going to look at are discreetly braced beams. So there's uh, uh, continuously braced where there's complete bracing across the board, and then discreetly braced where there's bracing every so often. And we're going to see differences in behavior and ultimately differences in design. Before we get to that, though, we kind of have to get back to basics with beams. I know for a lot of you that uh, it's been a while since you've had structural analysis. It's been a while since you've had Engineering 216, I know. Uh, and I know for some of you, uh, you know, the Engineering 216 has been a while and you might need a, a refresher. And so today is going to kind of serve as that, but it's also going to serve as a... Um, as an introduction to some new stuff. So it's kind of review, kind of new stuff, um, and, and that's what we're gonna talk about. What I'm gonna do today though, is I'm actually gonna focus a little bit on the board for the first part, because I kinda wanna walk you through some of the stuff that I think's uh, pretty important. So I'm gonna stop this share here. Uh, let me, my mouse pointer went away, let me stop my share. And I'm gonna pull my webcam up so that all you see is me um, and we're going to, uh, to talk a little bit uh, about bending uh, and about sigma equals my over i and all that stuff that it's been a while since you've talked about. One of the things that might be nice, though, just to follow along with me, and you'll kind of see why I'm talking about some of this, um, is I want you to open up the manual to the table on the W shapes, like table 1-1. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the section properties that are listed in Table 1.1 and maybe try and reveal really what's going on here because, you know, up until now we've been sort of using the values as needed, but maybe it's time to really sort of pull the curtain back. So, for instance, if you look at the page on the right, you'll see the W shapes. And, for instance, we have the X axis and the Y axis, and we have... Um, uh, for example, I, S, R, and Z, and we haven't really talked about what all of those are. We've used some of them, but not all of them. After today, you'll know what all of these are. In fact, uh, the, the, the goal at the end of the day is to figure out how to compute Z. That you know, maybe the, the be-all, end-all goal of our, of our lecture is the last letter of the alphabet. Now, I want to talk a little bit about stresses and about... Um, what are the differences between stresses in bending and stresses in axial and how we compute all of that. So um, let's, let's go back to basics here, okay? So for example, um, if I have a section, let's see if I can put some art to this. This marker's kind of rough. It's been a while since I've used it. And I take this section and I apply, you know, a load to it. Maybe it just needed to be broken in a bit, okay? So what I can do is I can say, okay, here's a load. This is an axial load, okay? So I'm taking this element. Let's say it's this you know, rubber I-beam. I'm taking it and I'm pressing it. Uh, and I could take it and I could pull it. It doesn't really matter if it's you know, in compression or in tension for the purposes of what I'm talking about. I'm really just talking about an axial load. And when I use that term axial, I mean along the, you know, the main axis of the member. And by now, you know how to compute that, that axial stress. That axial stress is P over A, right? And so what we're doing is we're taking our force 
and we're dividing it by this term a. And this term a, um, more generally, is what's called a section property. So if I, you know, samurai sword or lightsaber through the the cross section or through the through the member, and I look at the cross section, that cross section, you know, in this case, we're talking about an eye beam. There are certain numerical properties about this shape, and we call those section properties. And so, a very you know common numerical property is the cross-sectional area. How you know what's the area of this shape? And so, if I have the area of this shape, and I know how much axial load I'm applying to it, I can determine the axial stress. That's pretty simple. Okay. But what I want to talk about today is instead what happens when you bend it. Okay. So. You know, the first thing I'm going to do, so here's the section. The first thing I'm going to do is indicate or highlight where the neutral axis is or the neutral surface. So if this is a rectangular section, it's going to be somewhere, you know, along the middle. Now let's take this section and let's apply a bending moment to it. Okay, so here's sort of a, a, a physical view of what that looks like. So here's the section, okay, and I'm going to take it and I'm going to bend it. Okay, now when I bend it, First thing you can see is that, you know, here I'm going to try and maybe sort of use my shoulder here to go along with that. So here's the section and it's being bent. Um, if you can kind of visualize this, you know, in your head, you know, you can, or, or you can kind of see it because you're looking at it, you can see that the top of the, uh, the beam, you know, if it's being bent this way, the top of it is sort of going into compression and the bottom of it is going into tension, right? So the bottom of it is being stretched and the top of it is being smushed, right? And so if the top is being smushed and the bottom is being stretched, there is a point in the middle where it's not really seeing any stress at all. And that's the neutral axis. And that occurs at the centroid. Okay. And so if we plot the bending stresses, so, you know, here's the, the cross section right here, right? And here's that neutral axis. If we plot the bending stresses, so here's where the neutral axis is. And let's say, you know, here's the section. So there's the top and there's the bottom those bending stresses kind of look something like this. So they start, there's zero right here, and they're linear from the, uh, from the section. So they're linear, you know, right here. So it might be zero there and up here. This is it being in compression. This is it being in tension. So this is in compression and this is in tension. Okay. And instead of there being just a value, you know, this is just a value P over A, this is a constant. We instead get an equation for stress. So we get, uh, the stress and the stress is going to be a function of y, y being however far you are from the centroid, right? And so what we do for that is, you know, we compute the stress as being, you know, we take the moment, multiply it by y, but the slope of that line is going to be the moment divided by this term i, which is the moment of inertia. Now, I'm going to take a second and stop and see if anybody has any questions about this. All this is is just the equation of a line you know, as a function of y, you know, like y equals mx plus b, I guess. So our x in this case is however far you are from the centroid. And the slope of that line is just the bending moment divided by the moment of inertia. And this is something that you derive in, in mechanics of materials or mechanics of deformable bodies. It's also one of the reasons why this stuff kind of showed up when we were talking about columns. If you have a column and you load it in compression, right, and it buckles, what does it mean to buckle? Well, it's bending, right? So when it's bending, we're going to see this term I. Now, we saw I a little bit of a different way. Instead of uh, using the term I, we used the term R. So, so what is R? R is just the square root of I over A. See, I, if you measure, if you're talking about inches, I is measured in inches to the fourth. And so normalizing it this way, you get an R value in inches. So I and R are kind of the same thing, just R is a bit normalized. And R is pretty convenient because if you take the length of a member and you divide it by R, you get a slenderness expression that is in fact unitless. So that's why R is pretty uh, valuable. I'm going to stop that for a second. I want to see if anybody has any questions so far. Is anybody with me? Everybody with me so far? Okay. All right. Okay. So a couple of things. All right. Uh, let's say that here's your bending stress profile. I'm, I think I'm in the way of that. Here's your bending stress profile. Here's the neutral axis. And it looks like this. Hold on. 
I think my heart's not going to do very well there. Okay. Now, so let's say here's your bending stress profile. Okay. Now, where is the maximum bending stress if I, if I look at this section? Well, it's in two places. It could either be in the top or it could be on the bottom. Now, if the section is symmetric, right, if, it's got, if the centroid is right smack dab in the middle, then this distance right here, this distance, and this distance are going to be the same, okay? So uh, a lot of times in, in engineering land, we call this distance C, okay? So this distance might be C. Let's say that this distance is also C, okay? So this would be a scenario like uh, if we were talking about like with an I-beam. Because if you look at the centroid of an I-beam, so here's the I-beam right here, the centroid is right smack dab in the middle. So the distance between here and here and the distance between here and here are going to be the same. So if I take this I-beam and I bend it like I would bend it you know, in a building, I'm going to get, you know, here's where the top, you know, the maximum bending stress is, is here and here, and those values are going to have the same magnitude. Like one's in compression and one's in tension, but the magnitudes are going to be the same, okay? And so the sigma max is going to be, you know, m over i, but instead of m over uh, m y over i, it's just going to be m, o, uh, m over i times this term c, right? Because, you know, this is where y equals zero, this is where y equals c. Now, um, what we do in shorthand, because we kind of like terms like this, where it's sigma equals p over a, you know, we could just take the load and divide it by a number. We, we like to use shortcuts in, in, uh, in civil engineering. So um, we define a new term. We define this term i over c. We call it the section modulus s. And so it's a constant value for a section that's doubly symmetric. So we can replace this as m over s. Okay. So for instance, if you go back to table 1-1, you're going to see an i value. That's the moment of inertia. You're going to see an r value. That's just that normalization of the moment of inertia. Just take i over a and take the square root of that. You can test that for any of the uh, sections in the manual. Just take i over a and take the square root and you'll get the r value. And then there's S. S is just the section modulus. If you want to find the section modulus for a section like this, let's say the section modulus about the x-axis, take the I value and divide it by half the depth and you will get the section modulus. If you want to find the section modulus about the y-axis, you're going to take the I value about the y-axis and divide it by half of this, half of the BF, and you'll get the, get the same answer. So if you ever want to test that out, Test it out for any W shape and, and you'll see that it works. With me so far? Okay, now the only other thing to keep in mind is what if your section isn't symmetric? So what happens if you have a bending stress profile that looks maybe, I don't know, like that? So. When, uh, so what happens if you have a larger bending stress on one end than you do the other, okay? Well, when would this ever happen in real life? Well, it would happen if you ever had maybe an I-beam, I don't know, that looks something like this. So let's say you have an I-beam, but one of the flanges is bigger than the other. If that ever happens, what that does is that changes where the centroid is. See, instead of the centroid being right smack dab in the middle, if let's say this top flange was bigger, then the centroid's going to move up some, right? So maybe the centroid is like right there. So that's the point where you have zero bending stress. So we're going to have zero bending stress right here, smaller compressing, bigger tension. So like a, a real quick, you know, concrete design lecture. I know this is steel design. But this, you know, we kind of do this sometimes in concrete design because concrete is a material that loves to be in compression. So we might force more concrete up to the top and put a bunch of steel down here to resist the tension. So, you know, there you go, food for thought for, for another day. Um, in this scenario, though, the term S doesn't really make any sense because you don't have the same S value for the top as you do for the bottom. So, this, so you're going to have different C distances. Like this might be C for the top. This might be C for the bottom, you know, I'll put C bottom, C top. So, you know, in this instance, we might not have a single S value. We might have S for the top and S for the bottom. 
Okay, everybody with me so far? The other, the other final point I will mention is that all of these neutral axes are where the centroid is. Um, so if you remember from statics, how do you compute the centroid? You take the sum of AY divided by the sum of the A's. So we're going to do uh, that in order to determine where the centroid is for a given shape, and then that's where we can determine uh, you know, our bending stress. So far so good? Any questions before I, I transition over to the PowerPoint? I'm going to take that as a no. So let me go here. Let me share my screen. Give me one sec. Hold on. Oh, hold on. I gotta change something here. Hold on. I forgot to change my monitor. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay. So uh, let me go back to, to what I was talking about here with the bending stresses. So um, what we're getting at here is, is I want to get a quick review of the elastic bending stress stuff that you did in Engineering 216. So if I have a beam and I subject it to some sort of load, okay, you know, we can determine our bending stress is MY over I. Okay, and as we know by now, hopefully this is pretty clear, we're going to have different moments of inertia dependent upon whether or not the beam is being bent this way or it's being bent this way. So the, uh, the, the way that we compute that is we compute sigma equals my over i, uh, i being the moment of inertia, y being the distance from the centroid to the point in question, and m being the bending moment. Now to be clear, where do we get the bending moment? The bending moment comes from the moment diagram. So that comes from what we did last semester in structural analysis. You know, uh, it's usually taken where the moment is highest. So if you have a simply supported beam, uniformly distributed load, we can compute that as WL squared over eight. Uh, I know it's been a while since you've done that stuff, but everybody should remember that. Don't worry, we'll, we'll ease you into that as we, as we discuss this stuff. Now, um, let's see, where's my mouse pointer, sorry. Okay. Now the section modulus, uh, again, that comes from just taking, that's just trying to simplify some of the, the, the formulas. If we're only interested in maximum bending stress, uh, we have a shortcut and we can use that, uh, that's the section modulus. That's just taking uh, the moment of inertia and dividing it by this term C. And we call that the extreme fiber distance. That's what I was talking about here. It's just the distance from the centroid to either the very, very tippy, tippy, tippy top of the beam or the very, 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 very bottom of the beam. And again, we have an S value about the X axis and a S value about the Y axis, just depending upon uh, how it's being bent. Now, um, what, I, uh, what I wanna talk about now is uh, how that relates to capacity. So ba this is basic bending theory that we're talking about. And basic bending theory assumes elastic behavior. And so it assumes that the beam behaves like a rubber band. I take the load, I put the load on the beam, I take the load off, it snaps back and reverts back to its original position, okay? And elastic bending theory holds true until your maximum bending stress equals Fy. So you all know by now that, you know, here's the, you know, stress strain curve, you know, for steel, right? So this is Fy, this is, you know, Fu, uh, this uh, is the Young's modulus, and so, you know, there's our bending stress, you know, everything before FY, you know, the, the uh, steel behaves like a rubber band. Once we get past FY, we get into permanent deformation land. Elastic bending theory holds true until the maximum bending stress, the stress at the very, very top or the stress at the very, very bottom hits FY. So if you have a beam and you start bending it, what happens is this. So, you know, here's the, the bending stress profile. Here's the... Um, the, the centroid right here, 
And what happens is we start, you know, bending it. And so, you know, we might have bending stress that looks like this, and then it gets bigger, and then it gets bigger, you know, and so that bending stress keeps increasing and increasing and increasing until, bam, we hit Fy. And so that right there, there is a name for that state where the top stress and the bottom, either the top stress or the bottom stress equals Fy, we call that the yield moment. And so if you want to compute the yield moment of a beam, take the, uh, the yield stress and multiply it by the section modulus. Because remember, sigma equals m over s, that's the, that's the maximum bending stress. So if we take that stress, set it equal to Fy, solve, there you go, there's the yield moment. Okay. Now the big thing to, to, to keep in mind though, we're going to talk about this here in a second, is that the yield moment is not the maximum moment that, can a, that a beam can withstand. That's just the maximum moment that we can use under elastic bending theory. That's the bending theory that you all used and learned in Engineering 216 and what we've done uh, so far. So the big question is, can a beam withstand moment larger than this? The answer is yes, but we're going to get to that here in a second. I want to stop for, for now because I know today is going to be a little bit of theory land and I want to make sure that everybody's clear on this. Anybody have any questions before we move on? Move my microphone, make sure that you all can hear me. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Um, the yield moment is the largest bending moment that you can apply under this assumption of elastic bending. But is it the largest moment that a beam can withstand? The answer is no, and here's why. Okay, so let me show you a bending stress profile. And let's put our centroid here. And let's say that we've hit the yield moment. So here's stress profile. And let's say this is Fy and this is Fy. Okay, so to be clear, what that means is, oh, what that means is, um, oh, God bless you, I'm trying to get my eye beam here. So let's say here's the I-beam. What we're saying is that we've hit yielding just right here and right here. Okay, That's all that means is that we've hit the yield stress at the very, very top and the very, very bottom. There's still a whole lot of beam that can, that can hold more load. We, what about this? You know, this part hasn't yielded or that part hasn't yielded. So if we kept applying moment, if we kept increasing the load, could we get more capacity out of this beam? The answer is yes, and we're going to see that here in a second. But right now I want to go back to some basics with, you know, centroids and, and, uh, and, and you know, mechanics of deformable bodies to get a little bit more into the details to make sure that you all remember how to do this. So we're going to look at a symmetric beam example. Now, before we get into this, I want to be clear, I've already done a lot of the math for you and it's already in the slides. So you all don't need to do any math. You could sort of put your pencils down and just watch this. Um, and all these slides are on Blackboard, so, don't, so, so everybody has this. But I want to look at and just show you the guts behind how you actually compute uh, the yield moment for a beam. Okay, So we're going to look at this beam. This is a really simple beam. Uh, it has a top flange and a bottom flange that's 12 inches by 1 inch and the web is 24 by an inch. So the total height of the section is 26 inches. So I can just look at this and tell you where the centroid is. The centroid is right in the middle or 13 inches from the top or bottom. Now. Um, this beam is symmetric, okay? Because of that, we could do the calculations a bit more in a bit more of a streamlined fashion. What I'm about to show you on the next slide is maybe not the most efficient way of doing it. I'm calling it the long way. But the reason I'm doing that is because if you understand how to do a symmetric beam, then you'll understand how to do a non-symmetric beam. So the idea is to do it the hard way now so that you can kind of follow along and then we'll, we'll move on. Mr. Enoch, yes sir. If part of the, if, if part of the member is reaching the yield stress, doesn't that mean it's, it's unusable because it's, it's not gonna go back to its original shape for which it was designed to handle load under? 
You're, so, you're so, exactly so, right. so although so although the rest there may be other parts of the beam that are useful, wouldn't that change like everything about the design of the system you, that's meant to handle load? You're you're exactly right. Let me let me um, clarify a couple things, and um, and we'll we'll. Um, We'll, we'll dig into that a bit further. You are right that, well, that once you, you yield it, you're experiencing permanent deformations. I'm always hesitant to say that just because it's yielded doesn't mean it's not usable. For instance, when we did tension members, the net section, we let that get all the way up to FU, and that was past the yield stress. So uh, just because something's yielded doesn't mean it's not usable. Um, there are instances in bridges where we actually allow yielding in certain regions to, to redistribute moments. So that but that's a really advanced topic for, for, for another day. Um, the yield moment, to be clear, the yield moment is where you, is when that starts to happen. Uh, it's just when the very, very tippy top of the section reaches FY. What we're going to do is load past that. So up until the yield moment, you can snap back and go back to its original position. But we, we are going to go past that. Don't worry. So some of, some of that I might not have answered, but we will here in a bit. So far, so good? Yeah. Okay. Now, um, so let's dig into the section properties. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you there's a lot going on on this slide. So it's okay. Just take, just, just bear with me. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off computing the location of the centroid. Okay. Now this is a statics review, right? Do you all remember this from statics? You know, sum of AY over sum of A. So what we're going to do is compute the centroid. Now, again, I know where the centroid is. I can just look at it and see that the centroid is 13 inches from the, from the bottom. But I want to do this together so that uh, the long way so that whenever we have a non-symmetric beam, we can go through this. Okay. So the first thing to do in order to compute the centroid is we need to compute the areas. So I just compute the area of the top flange, the area of the web, the area of the bottom flange, add all that up and I get an area of 48 square inches. The next thing I do is I compute these Y distances. If you remember when you compute centroids, you have to reference all of your Y distances from a common location so that whenever you get the centroid, you know where that centroid's measured from. What I tend to do is measure all my distances from the very bottom right here. So for instance, the bottom flange, how far is it from that bottom surface to the centroid of the bottom flange? It's just a half inch up because the centroid of the bottom flange is, um, is right here. So I'm just figuring out how far it is from that centroid to the, to the bottom, okay? So that's why I got the half inch. And so I do that um, for the web, I do that for the top flange, and then I do A times Y, A times Y, A times Y sum all that up and I get 624 square inches. So if I take the sum of A, Y over the sum of A, I get 13 inches. And that's exactly what I expected to get, okay? Now, in order to compute the moment of inertia though, which is what I need, you know, to, to, to get my yield moment and moving on, um, I need to recall a couple of things. So what we're ultimately doing here is we're using what's called the, the parallel axis theorem. I'm not sure if you did this in like statics or if you did this in deformables. So it, this is probably a mix of, of a couple of those classes, um, which is why I've, I've done a lot of this and provided the calculations for you. Um, but ultimately what we're using is uh, the following expression. So I equals the sum of this. I've got to believe at some point you've seen this, whether you saw it in statics or deformables, you did. This is just a way of computing a section property for something that's not just a rectangle. In this case, an I-beam is a bunch of little rectangles. So for each of those little rectangles, we have to compute its individual moment of inertia, the area, and this term D. So the areas, we've already got that figured out. The moments of inertia, the moments of inertia of a rectangle are just bh cubed over 12, right? I think everybody, uh, it's probably been a while since you've done that, but I've got to believe you've seen that at some point or another in, in, in one, of your, one of your classes. The one thing though that's kind of unique is maybe this d value, but it's actually really easy. You just take each one of these little y values and subtract it from the y bar from the whole thing. 
one of the nice things about this is it doesn't really matter which way you subtract. You can do y minus y bar or y bar minus y. It doesn't really matter because you're going to end up squaring d in the end. Um, and then go through the, the, the process, go through the algorithm, and you get a moment of inertia of 4904 inches to the fourth. So if you're ever curious uh, how these I values are computed for all these I shapes, this is kind of how it's done. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that because you've got, you know, rounded sections, you know, and whatnot, but this is b basically it. Um, I'm not expecting you to, you know, regurgitate this. I just kind of want you to get the idea. You're not going to have to repeat this. You're not going to have to do this on an exam or a homework. Don't worry about that. I just want to make sure that you kind of follow what I'm talking about here. Is everybody good so far? Okay. So if I have the moment of inertia, I can compute. So here's the moment of inertia. I can then com oh, I can then compute the section modules to take the moment of inertia and divide it by 13 inches because that's from the very or the moment of inertia divided by that distance from the centroid to the very very top. Uh, and I get 377.2, and it's uh, the units are cubic inches. So just take that and multiply it by Fy, and that's the yield moment right there. And so when you chug it out, you get a yield moment of about uh, 1,570 foot kips. So that's the moment required just to reach FY at the very, very top or the very, very bottom. So to use Mr. Uh, Enoch's expression, this would be the point at which, quote unquote, the steel starts to become un unusable. It hasn't happened yet. This is just the point where that starts. Okay. But that sort of leads into to my point. Um, is that the largest moment that the beam can withstand? The answer is no, okay? Because again, that's when Fy is reached at the very, very top or the very, very bottom. What if I kept increasing the moment? Well, if I kept increasing the moment, it would look like this, okay? So what happens is, you know, the, this is the yield moment right here. This is when I reach Fy at the very, very top or the very, very bottom. But I could keep adding moment. And what would happen is that yielding would start to penetrate throughout the section. And what would happen is I would keep increasing the moment until I hit this. And this is when FY is everywhere, okay? So instead of uh, having a situation where we call, where, where this is the yield moment, now we have, we have a situation where yielding has penetrated throughout the entire cross section, okay? And at this point, we have a section that is quote unquote completely unusable because now the entire section has yielded or in, in engineering term, we say the entire section has plastified. So this is a, a particular state that we call the plastic moment. So if this is the yield moment, this is the plastic moment. Okay. So to put it in Mr. Enoch's terms, this is completely unusable. This is when the beam is done. So like if we were in the lab and, and we were testing beams, I would have no problem taking a nap under a beam right here. I'd have no problem with that because I know the beam's fine. But the plastic moment, that's danger. That's bad. That's, that's when we're done. All right. Does that phenomena, that idea, kind of make sense? Everybody with me so far? Okay. Now, the nice thing about MP and, and whatnot, it's actually easier to compute. Uh, it seems like it's a harder idea to wrap your head around, but the math is actually very, very easy. All we do is we sum moments, okay? So what we would do is we would take the force in each plate and we would multiply it times the moment arm from the centroid. So the force in plate A times however far it is from the centroid or the force in this plate times however far it is from the centroid. And we sum all that up and boom, it's the, the, the plastic moment. So none of this like really complicated algorithm stuff, we don't have to worry about that with the plastic moment. It's, not, it's actually easier. Um, but one of the things that you find is that if you start summing up all the forces, well, the way that you compute the force in the plate is you take Fy times the area. So Fy times the area of this plate, Fy times the area of this plate, Fy times the area of this plate. And all the terms have an Fy in it. So if you factor out the Ay, 
you have this, this new section property. It's just areas of plates times distances. And there is a name for that section property. We call it the plastic section modules. We call it this term Z, okay? So Z is the plastic section modulus for, for a given cross section. If you open up table 1-1, one, -one, one of the other things that you will find, I don't care what section you look at, Z is always bigger than S. The plastic section modulus is always bigger than the elastic section modulus. So if you ever hear me use those terms, S is sometimes called the elastic section modulus, Z is sometimes called the plastic section modulus. If we wanted to compute um, uh, Z for the beam in question, you know, if we look at this beam, you know, we know this point right here is this, you know, that, that's, you know, going to be where that, that centroid is. So, for example, all we do is we take the area. So, what is the area of this plate? It's 12 square inches. And we multiply it by however far it is from this line to the centroid. And how far is it from there to there? It's 12 and a half inches, so 12 and a half inches. We'll look right here, 12 times 12 and a half inches. And so we just do that for all of the four plates. We have the top flange, we have the bottom flange, and we have the two webs on either side of the line. Sum all that up, and we get a Z value of 444 square inches. If you compare that against what we got before, what we got before, we had an S value of 377, Z is now 444. You can always add a little bit more load because now, you know, we're allowing that yielding to penetrate throughout the entire section. So Z should be a little bit bigger than S or MP should be a little bit bigger than MY. Here was what we got for MP. Here's what we get for MY. All right, I'm going to stop for a second, see if anybody has any questions. Don't worry, we're going to have an example on some of this here in a second. But the two observations that I really want you to, to, to recognize, Z is so much easier to compute than S, and Z is always bigger than S, or MP is always bigger than MY, every time. All right. Now, Everything that we've been talking about just now has been dealing with symmetries, symmetric sections, okay? So we were talking about, you know, like this I-beam here, okay? So in this I-beam, you know, this I-beam is symmetric, right? Everything up top equals, you know, everything on the bottom. Um, what if you have a section that's non-symmetric, okay? Now, when would you ever handle the, uh, a non-symmetric section? I will give you a clear definitive, uh, definitive example, and that's in a bridge. I even have some students in here right now that are in uh, capstone and we're doing bridge design and they'll tell you that it's possible that you have non-symmetric sections. Like in steel land, you might have a different top flange than you do a bottom flange. It's very common uh, in plate girder land. Well, what we end up doing to handle that uh, is we end up actually having two different centroids. So um, the centroid that you all are familiar with, the one that... Um, uh, that you all know and have been aware of before you took this class, I'm going to call that the elastic neutral axis. That's where the centroid is. But now we're going to have a new term called the plastic neutral axis. And the plastic neutral axis is where the area on top equals the area on the bottom. It's the axis that splits the section into two equal areas because that's the point where we're going to sum moments in order to get Z. Now, it might seem like those would be in the same place, but when you have a section that's not symmetric, that's not the case, okay? Um, if it is symmetric, they are in the same place, but whenever, um, whenever they are, are, are not uh, symmetric, they can move, okay? And the easiest way to go through that is to look at this example. So we're gonna compute ZX together for this beam, okay? This is, uh, 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 specifically, we're going to bend the section about the horizontal axis, and we're going to see about computing ZX for this beam. And you'll find it's actually a really straightforward calculation, but I'm going to show you later how the, where the centroid is and where the plastic neutral axis is, is not the same location. This is a very straightforward calculation. I know I've done a lot of theory and a lot of math with you today, but if you follow the, um, the, the, the step, I think you're going to find this is pretty simple. So let me, um, let me stop my share here and let me see if I can share my notebook. Okay, so 
So here's my cross section. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and figure out where this um, axis right here lies. Okay. And I'm going to call this the plastic neutral axis. Okay. Now, again, the plastic neutral axis is the point where the area on top equals the area on the bottom. And that is not the same place as the centroid. The centroid is where sum of AY divided by sum of A, where that line equals. And it's not the same place. And we'll see that shortly. But for now, the P and A, again, that's, that's our goal. And note, the P and A is where area top equals area bottom. Now, the way to do this is actually pretty straightforward, okay? Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna come up with some variables here to try and define this. Now, here's the thing. I have no idea where this is. I'm guessing that this line is probably gonna be somewhere in the web. Um, I don't know where it is. But uh, I think this is a good guess. So what we'll do is we'll call this dimension X. Okay. And just to make sure everybody's paying attention, if this dimension is X, what is this dimension? There we go. 32 minus X. That's what I like to see. Okay. So no, no, the, the, the D is the entire 32, right? This dimension here, that's 32. Now that, that whole thing's 32. Okay, so what I'm going to try and do is see if I can come up with a formula for the area on the top and see if I can come up with a formula for the area on the bottom. So. That's fine. Um, so the area on the top, what do we have on top? We've got 14 by 3 quarters. Here, we'll leave the units off um, since everything's in inches. Uh, 14 uh, times 3 quarters plus we've got the height of this rectangle, which is 32 minus X, and then the width of this rectangle, which is 5 eighths. Okay, so... What is 14 times 3 quarters? 14 times 3 quarters is 10.5 plus, and so 32 times 5 eighths is 20 minus 5 eighths x. So 10.5 plus 20 is 30.5 minus 5 eighths x. So that's a formula for the area on the top. What about the area on the bottom? So this is 18 times 1.25 plus 32, hold on, sorry, no, not 32, sorry, times x times 5 eighths. All right, so 18 times 1.25 is 22.5 plus 5 8 sets. All right, so that's the area on the bottom. And so the plastic neutral axis is where the area on the top equals the area on the bottom. So set those two equal to one another, 30.5 minus 5 8 x equals 22.5 plus 5 eighths x. And so all we got to do is just solve. So, you know, we add 5 eighths x to both sides. And then we subtract 22.5 from both sides. Right? So, over here, we got 30.5 minus 22.5, which is 8, equals 5 four x. Did I do that right? All 
Everybody following along with me? Did I do that right? Or did I have the typo? I'm making sure y'all are paying attention. Okay, yeah. And you can check this. You can always just plug, you know, compute the area below and the area above and see if you get the same answer. So now, if I'm being lazy here, so now here's our section. Six point four inches, right? That's the point where the area above equals the area below. So if that's six point four inches, this is six point or thirty two off of that. And so this is 25.6. And so now in order to compute ZX, ZX is actually pretty easy. Um, I like to do it in a table just because I, uh, if I have a lot of shapes because I think it's kind of easy. You can do it in a table or do it in an equation. It doesn't really matter. But what we're going to do is we're going to take each shape. We're going to compute its area. And then its Y. And then we'll just compute AY. So what we'll do is we'll number them. We'll call this shape one, shape two, shape three, shape four. And so that's the sort of dividing line. So like shape one, uh, the area is just 14 times um, 0.75. So that's 10.5. And then the Y distance, now this is where I wanna make sure everybody's paying attention. The Y distance is however far the centroid is from my PNA. So I'm, I'm interested in that distance right there. That's Y1. So does anybody know what that is? I want to make sure y'all are paying attention. Now hold on, 25.6 plus 0.75, but that's to the top. See, this dimension right here is not three quarters, it's as Mr. Ball said, it's three eighths. So it's 25.6 uh, plus three eighths. So we're going from centroid to centroid, right? So for instance, on Y4, I want the distance to right there. That's Y4. So for instance, if we did like two, three, four, Y4 is gonna be 6.4 plus half of 1.25. And so that's gonna be like 7.025. Does that make sense? times 1.25 and so yeah that's gonna be like 22.5 so I'm getting like 25.975 yeah that's what I'm getting and then what you do is you sum these up um, and then that's gonna be your ZX I we're, we are running a little bit out of time but I want to show you something real quick um, bear with me Uh, there it is. Bear with me. I want to show you something. So, I just want to show you something. I'll probably post a really, really short video finishing this example so that you have it. Um, but if you continue on with this example, what I did is... Um, I summarized uh, the ZX computation and I also summarized the PNA. Now what I'm doing is I'm reporting 7.65 inches. We got 6.4, but the difference is I'm, I'm referencing it from the bottom. So if you take 6.4 and you add the one and a quarter thickness, that's where you get the 7.65. But what I did here um, 
is I computed the section modulus, the, the yield moment and all that, and I showed that if you actually follow along, you get a different location uh, from where the centroid is to where the plastic neutral axis is. It's actually in a different spot. And you can go through and follow all the calculations to, to kind of see that. And, and I do suggest that you go through that um, just for your own like education. I think it's worthwhile. I promise that the homework that I, that I assigned for this lecture is probably one of the easiest homeworks we've had this entire semester. You'll see what I mean when you, when you look at it. But what I want you to do is compute ZX for the shape in question. And if you look at it, I think you're going to find it's pretty simple. Um, I'm going to finish this ZX uh, calculation uh, in a, uh, a quick, uh, uh, a short little video just to make sure that you have it for your records. And then we will, um, on Wednesday, uh, or sorry, on Monday, I, oh man, I thought it was beginning of the week. Uh, on Monday, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about uh, uh, beams and particularly continuously braced beams because the flexural capacity is just going to be FY times Z. Um, and so I want you to try and have a little bit of uh, an understanding as to what Z is. But we are running short on time, and so I'm going to go ahead and stop it. Unless anybody has any like conceptual questions, I'd be happy to address them. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recordings, and I'm going to see about finishing this example real quick, and I'll post that on the, uh, on the um, YouTube channel. That's all I have, everybody. I will see you all next week. You all have a wonderful weekend.